is the um, Legislative Matters Meeting May 14, 2018. I'm uh, the Chair of Bill Dwight, and I'm going to ask Pam to call the roll so we can get this party started. Councilor Dwight? Here. Councilor Carney? Present. Councilor Klein? Here. Councilor Murphy? Here. All right, everyone's here. We, are, we have a quorum, so we're convened. Is there public comment? I coordinate the North Central Prevention Coalition and I'm a resident of Leeds, Mass. So I'm just here. I did write notes because of time today. So thank you to City Council for considering caps of the marijuana retail establishments. I think that's a smart move. Um, I brought for everybody's perusal some articles just to let you know that um, by doing a quick Google search, I was able to see that despite marijuana's like relatively recent legal status, They've already been starting to do research on things like outlet density and how it affects mostly property, um, like crime rates around property damage, not necessarily violent crime. So what I wrote down is that there are numerous studies that have found positive correlations between high alcohol outlet densities and high rates of violent crime, property crime, and poor family health. Though the studies on marijuana outlet density aren't as easy to find with its recent legal status, I was able to find a few through a simple Google search. Um, higher outlet density is correlated positively with increased property crime and marijuana-specific crimes. But I found this really interesting, but not in the immediate area next to the outlets. What they did find is that the security measures that these um, retailers were putting in were actually very, very effective, but the crime was spilling out into adjacent neighborhoods. Um, so that was one concern that I had hearing about density numbers is just, of course, I'm coming from a prevention standpoint, so I'm going to say lower is better. Um, but I'd say moving forward, what I'd like to advocate for is to just make sure that we're doing so with purpose and to ensure that we adopt this new market in a manner that does not put our community at risk, overburden our law enforcement officers, or inadvertently create a criminal market that could into a crime in the fashion industry as it stands now. So that's all I prepared for today was just to say I'm really glad that you are considering caps since we have them for alcohol. Um, it seems like it would make sense to do it for marijuana as well. And um, since it's a new market and we're not really sure how it's going to shake out, it seems like going slow would be the way to go. And can I leave you with yeah. the research um, articles? Yeah. Okay. So we go to okay. Just leave it there and sure. the uh, council final pass around. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Yeah. Just say a few words. Okay. I'm not sure how they'll be able to say, so I'm just going to say a That's fine. Yeah. You, you have to <laughs> identify yourself and address, please. Yeah. I'm Ruth Ever. I'm at 17 Chesson Avenue Leeds. Um, and I'm a public health advocate and have been for probably 30 years or so, mostly in the field of substance use prevention <coughs> and underage um, use prevention. And um, I just feel like I want to have some comments on um, urging city council to move slowly and cautiously. This is, this is you know, this is an industry that's going to be with us for the long haul. There's going to be plenty of time to add later, but once we open it up, it's much harder to contain it. And if we've learned anything from the other legalized drugs, in particular tobacco, it's the having to backpedal and having to spend decades and resources and money trying to you know, put the genie back in the bottle is so much harder and so much more expensive and takes so much of a bigger toll on our young people. And we have a responsibility to our young people. And I've sat in a lot of hearings in other towns, and there's a lot of talk about how it's up to the parents, and it's, it's about education. And I don't disagree with any of that. And it's also true, as with many things in the field of health and public health, our community, where we stand as a community, sends a message to our youth. And if we take no stand and we have a laissez-faire attitude, that sends a message to our youth even if we put any kind of cap on. So the fact that you're looking at 10 to me is way too many for a town of this size, but I'm encouraged that you're looking at anything at all because honestly, I just I feel like we need to make sure that our youth are getting the message that um, we're, thinking, you know, we're thinking well about them, we care about them, um, we want them to be and grow up into healthy, responsible, um, young adult, uh, adults who can um, have their brains at their best capacity. And what we know about all drugs is that the young brain, the teen brain is still developing and the farther we can push that off, uh, the better. I'm not saying that by having stores that's directly correlated. I realize it's not. And, and the security in these stores is not where the kids are gonna be getting it, but the message from our community is still gonna be coming across to them. 
So I think that the more that we can say, we're being thoughtful about this, we're moving slowly, we don't know what the impact is gonna be. We really have no way of knowing until if we start to roll out a whole new industry like this. So I think I just would urge to move cautiously, slowly, knowing that you can reassess this in a year, in two years, as things move forward and things change, and the regulations will probably change at the state level as well. So, thank you. Uh, Lori. Um, Lori Loisel, 46 Ridge Avenue. I have been um, at a lot of public health meetings with these three, but, but I'm not a public health person. <laughs> I'm just speaking as a parent and a resident of Northampton, um, although I've learned a lot about what they're saying. And um, so I guess I just want to say that this is a this is a little bit unprecedented that we have this whole new industry moving into our city. And it's going to be a really big money maker. And there's no banks that will serve them. So they have, it has to be a cash only business. There's just a lot about it that is different than all the other businesses in our city. So I really don't understand why why we have to start with that. The, the reg state regulations allow communities to set regulations, local regulations. And I don't know why anybody thinks we need 10 pot shops in Northampton. It just seems excessive to me. And I think starting smaller, and there's no problem, then you can you can let more come, but you're not going to close them if it is a problem. And when I looked around, you know, if you look at where package stores are, they're on the edges. They're not downtown. There's one like at the edge of Pleasant Street. There's one at the edge of King Street. And they're in grocery store parking lots, like where there's not a lot of foot traffic. And so that kind of makes sense to me. Um, I, I really believe what I, what I have read and heard from doctors, researchers about the effect of marijuana on the teen brain. And that's what my concern is kind of normalizing the use of marijuana for young people. And I've seen firsthand how it can derail lives and set young people up for a lifetime of struggle with addiction. And if you start later in life, it doesn't do that. So that's my concern. It's, it's legal for adults, but I just think that it's we're kind of being naive if we think, oh, it's legal for adults, so therefore kids aren't going to get it. That's just not how it works. We all know how kids are drinking and how they smoke and how they're vaping in schools and they're vaping marijuana in schools. I was walking down um, Main Street on Sunday. Huge, huge amount of pot that I could smell. And I just think about what kind of downtown do we want? I just don't feel like, I, I hope that this downtown doesn't become a place where people are smoking pot. It's just not what I want for our city. Um, I think that might be it, let me just see. Yep, that's it, thank you. Thank you. I think you're the only person left in the room. <laughs> okay. The only person who survived the gauntlet to get <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> oh, I know. I actually hopped the wall out there. Yeah, and all of us actually did a little more exercise before we have to get Oh, my goodness. Thank you. Um, thank you for entertaining a cap at all. I really appreciate that. Um, I, I really I, do. Can I interrupt and just yes. have you identify yourself yes, and that sure. so for the record? Yes, so I'm Heather Warner. I live at 115 Pine Street in Florence. Um, yeah, so so definitely thank you for, for um, entertaining a cap. I mean, I think it's... Like, on so many levels, it's important for us to regulate locally as much as we can as, as the state is regulating at the state level, just like alcohol is regulated locally. So I think it's really um, prudent for us to, you know, be looking at caps like this. So I had the same kind of statements where, you know, this is a new industry. We don't know what it's going to look like. We do know that it's market-driven and that, you know, because of that, you know, Places oftentimes try to get through every loophole they can. We've heard some great testimony from NETA, and it's a lovely facility, and we hope that they would all look like that, but we don't know that. That isn't the, the image that all marijuana industry may, you know, moving into Northampton may have for their place. So, um, you know, I think we really do need to consider what does our downtown look like? Um, and like Lori said, most of the alcohol retailers are not located right downtown. We have State Street, we have one down here, but not on Main Street. Um, and my understanding is that we are not really imposing any zoning 
you know, for, for marijuana in the community except for a 200 foot buffer from schools. So it's really, it really is a free for all. And, um, you know, I also think that, um, you know, a lot of people that I know that voted for legal marijuana and commercial recreational marijuana did so because they wanted to reduce the black market. They wanted uh, quality control for the product. They wanted to unclog, you know, jails and doing it for social justice reasons. But there's very few people who I know that really voted for it um, because they wanted like a free-for-all um, market industry to move in and sort of take over the town. That isn't the image they had when they voted yes. And you know, I, I think that it's not, there aren't a lot of people flooding the gates here to, to oppose this or, you know, I think there was a lot of people that don't, that until it's up and it's in front of their face on Main Street, that they don't know exactly what this is going to look like and what's happening. So, um, you know, that said, I have, I, I do have a large circle of people who, you know, one is on crutches and couldn't make it, um, who, who do feel pretty passionate about this issue. Um, and I know that some of them have written letters too. So um, I would say sort of some of the key reasons for having a cap, and I would advocate for a lower cap of three or four to start, but a 10 would suffice if that's all that will pass and not be vetoed and that kind of thing. And then I would fully support a cap of 10 if that's what, what it would amount, what it takes to get something passed. But I think like the reasons are, you know, this allows businesses to plan accordingly. When they know that Northampton has a cap of 10, they're not just eyeing it. Like I know I read in the paper that one of the prospective retailers has been planning this for three years and has sunk their life savings into it. it was, that was in the paper. And it's like, so places are already planning for this. And if we just invite everybody and say, oh, later we'll figure out a cap, I don't think it's gonna happen, because when do you impose that cap? At what point in somebody's business plan do you shut it down? We really need to do that now and then loosen it later if, if we find that we can handle more than 10. Um, I also think that um, caps uh, maintain the integrity of our downtown, both Northampton and Florence, as family-friendly, healthy, and vibrant spaces for both residents and tourists. Um, caps will uh, decrease crime in you know, the area and adjacent neighborhoods. We've seen studies on this. Um, it will decrease the normalization of marijuana, which leads to increased use of both adults and young people, and really protects young and vulnerable populations in our community, including those in recovery um, from exposure to, you know, I don't know, whatever the market would allow, you know, if it's market driven, how many shops, you know, I think there, there's a lot of towns, more than half of the communities in Massachusetts have voted no and are banning it from their communities. I think there's plenty of opportunity for us to have as much business as we want here, but we need to figure out what it is we want and not just have it be a free for all. So I thank you for your time. I really do support the cap. Um, I hope that you'll consider passing one and I hope that it sticks. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. So you go. Thank you, Pam. Pam will be excusing herself. So we're going into, um, there is no other public comment. Do you want to hear from us when you well, get to I'm it on the agenda? Or when it comes up? Is that okay? Yeah. Um, so we'll, we'll move into um, the regular meeting now. Uh, first of all, I'll accept a motion to approve the minutes from the previous meeting. So move. Is there a second? Second. Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Um, so may, now it, may we actually go out of order just to consider. Is the committee's preference to go out of order with it? To and move up here. item, I'm guessing. <laughs> if I had to guess, we were 18.080. Mm -hmm. Is that right? So that's an ordinance limiting the number of retail marijuana establishments in the city, and that's been referred by the council on April 5th to this committee for discussion. Uh, I will move approval of Bernard for Okay, there's a motion to approve. Second. Second, okay. Discussion. Can, um, can I ask a question of the commenters? Sure. Um, I'm just wondering, We Ananda talked about it, and I'm sorry that she left, but I'm wondering if you or um, the, the co-sponsors can speak to the, the studies that have been cited about a rise in crime, because I'm um, really interested in 
whether or not there's true causality. Mm -hmm. If there's, you know, it's really been proven that that's the reason for this rise in crime in adjacent neighborhoods, mm -hmm. which is what Ananda shared with us. So I'm just wondering if any of you. I have know that the study that she cited is based on a study in Denver, um, and and. I know she has that citation. Um, I know there's multiple studies, and I would have to get back to you on that. Um, I mean, I, it is, I think a lot of the studies that have been done um, have been done on alcohol, and, um, but there have, the Denver study that she's citing is on marijuana. So I can, I can check in with her about that too and get back to you. I haven't seen it directly, but mm, what I've heard is that I think it's, it's not, the shops themselves because the security is so high mm -hmm. there it's that people get the pot and then they're going in the surrounding area right that's I, we understood there. that but the question that i have is you know how are they proving the causality of those the, the rise in crime in those adjacent areas i think it might be in yeah. she gave us some stuff and it might actually talk about okay. that but i just was yeah she, she i know she cited it and i think it is just an overlay of sort of before retail marijuana and after and where you see the crime so I think that's what the study outlines, but I can double check on that. And do the co-sponsors? We, I, 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 I haven't looked at studies exhaustively, but I know there's a lot of correlations and I, like a lot of things early on, I think uh, studies of causality would come later down the road. I, I suspect there's not a lot of that there. The, I'm looking at the study now. Um, it's, it's got a few caveats. I'm sure conclusions that were made that um, be essentially that it's, it's kind of difficult to make a determination. You have property crime since it's over 34 months. So um, data from the study show the marijuana outlets contributed to 1,579 property crimes in Denver over 30 months, 34 months compared to combined alcohol outlet contribution of 1,521 difference of around um, 50. Um, marijuana outlets were responsible for slightly more. This is a report from Mr. Fleischer. Uh, but Fleischer cautioned that a direct comparison is difficult because the effects related to marijuana outlets take into account crimes in local and adjacent areas, while data for alcohol outlets only look at adjacent areas. Um, so there's some suggestions that comparing apples to oranges and uh, this one, also similar caveats. But I mean, I mean that goes with it. I mean, because of the collection data over the course of a of essentially Colorado, or mostly. Did you have more questions? Well, I'm also just wondering, and I don't know if you have a formal presentation, but I'd love to hear about the um, choice of that number of 10 and how you determined that that was what you wanted to put into the legislation and, and your thinking about and it. And if you're going to speak, I think, come to the podium, because I'm not sure what the camera is right. picking up, since this is for a I'll, I'll start off. So Go ahead. Um, well, I guess the... I'll, I'll, I'll get to the number of 10. And there's honestly nothing rigorous and scientific about it. Like, like a lot of these things, you, know, you sort of look at other examples and try to get something that, that feels right. And certainly admit there's nothing of a scientific basis for it. But I guess in a, in a more general way, what I wanted to say and, and what prompted me to, to, to propose this, this ordinance along with Council Nash is that I'm I'm, I'm not a I'm not a libertarian on this issue. I'm not a libertarian on many issues, and I'm certainly not a libertarian on, on this one. But I do think that there are appropriate places for regulation of the market, um, and I do think this is one of those. I'm, I'm not a proponent of unnecessary and unwise regulation, but I think in this case, not because there are exhaustive studies that show causality, but a lot of it is because it is a young industry, and whether it's in California or Oregon or Colorado, we don't have a lot of data. We haven't learned a lot yet. And I think that makes a strong argument for caution and taking it um, taking it a little bit slow. As, as, as I think you know, but I'll just go through a little bit. Of, a lot of what Council Nash and I learned came from city, city services uh, committee meeting where we had 
uh, the folks who are here today from the prevention coalitions, Chief Casper came in, and they presented their, I guess, their, their, their concerns, their, their, their sense of caution, to, and, and it translated into a desire to go slow, the sense that we can always, if, if we impose a cap, we can always raise the cap, we can always eliminate it entirely, but if we don't impose a cap at all, we can't go backwards. And I think that's a, that's, that's a lot of the rationale in, in, in my case for wanting to go slow. I do have some, I do share some sympathy for the public health uh, coalition that for our own health director, uh, Meredith O'Leary, who is also in favor of a, of, a, of a cap, as are all the members of the, the Board of Health. Um, there is, there is a lot of evidence about the impact of marijuana on youth brain development, and I'm sensitive to that. There are studies, and again, Dennis, hang on a second. There we go. There's a button. There's a button. There's a button. There's a oh, I, th I thought you were telling me how my time was. No, up. no, you're. No, no, no. Sorry, I threw you off your game. Whatever was on your back was garnering more attention. <laughs> I guess so. I guess so. Sorry. Sorry, Dennis. Sorry. 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 It but then there are studies and Chief Casper cites these of ER visits that are up, uh, traffic accidents of up, incidents of OUI that are directly traceable to drugs are up uh, where uh, there's been legalization, notwithstanding the difficulties of, in, in measuring, of course, for, for, for OUI purposes. And the chief, um, I was in touch with her today, and she, she said she, she, she's on the record as, as favoring a cap and favoring a cap of 10. She would probably, like others, favor a, a lower cap, but she understands that in an environment where there's many folks who don't want a cap at all, uh, maybe 10 is about as good as what, as what we can do. I frankly think the cap of three or four would be too low. And as to how, how we arrived at that, um, the, the, in East Hampton, their ratio of, of uh, they, they, they put a cap of six in place in relation to their population. That's pretty much what a cap of 10 would be here. Um, I think three or four or five is too few given our, given our population, given we're a tourism economy, given the, our desire to send a message that we're open for business. We want this industry. We want to welcome this industry and its tax revenue. Um, and the associated tourism dollars that go with it. I think we want to send send out send out that message. I think three or four would be uh, counter to that message. I think 15 or 20 is too many. We can always raise it to 15 or 20. So by, by some process like that, Councilor Klein, uh, I've arrived at 10 and there are others that are supportive of, of, that, of that number too. Um, my own sense, and I've said this at uh, one of our council meetings, is that I doubt that at least initially uh, uh, a cap is necessary because I'd be very surprised if we see uh, initially more than three or four or five or six retail marijuana establishments given the hurdles that have to be gone through to, to, to get there and they are, they are quite substantial. But we could be wrong. We could be wrong in that estimate. And I'd rather be cautious, put in place a cap, know that we can lift it, know that we can eliminate it, as opposed to dealing with a situation where uh, if contrary to our projections, for the next six months, there should be a, a, a large increase in, in or a large number of establishments that do make it through these 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 hurdles. We could we could never turn it back. So I'm a proponent of, of starting slow and not as slow as some others would wish, but starting slow and seeing what we learn from it. And that is very much the view of the of the of the, of the police chief and our director of public health as well. So. Other, other questions? Um, are there studies about the efficacy of, of caps? How, how effective they are? I mean, similar when we read this discussion around buffer. So yeah. Studies that prove the efficacy of a buffer zone for preventing or reducing. And unfortunately, I think, as we said, we had a narrow window in which to study these things, obviously, in narrow circumstances. So um, so over the last few years, 
um, any places in Colorado that imposed caps that showed a reduce or a reduction in consumption, crime, all the other things that we're concerned with? I doubt it because I mean they're not caps that have, that have gone in retroactively and reduced the number of places. So, so you, you, you can't do, you know, you know what what it's like with a cap in place and what it was like when there were more places because there was no cap in place. So, right. Yeah, I, I'm 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 certainly not aware. And and it could very well be that when we do down the road have good data, it's going to show that our that our that our concerns maybe weren't warranted. Um, but we just don't know that in the meantime. So it's, caution makes sense to me. The thing that concerns me is there's not a and mind you, we we don't restrict alcohol here. Uh, alcohol sales that's a state imposition. That was the state when they came out of prohibition and established state laws and the ABCC. That was their criteria. In fact, actually, Northampton, uh, at least some dimensions of Northampton, would like to have the opportunity to provide more liquor stores. Right. The reason, and we should be clear, the reason there aren't liquor stores on State Street has nothing to do with zoning. Uh, they used to be on State Street. It has more to do with the Main values of, <laughs> of Main those Street. business Main spaces. Street. Yeah. Yeah, so. And it, it means, yeah, Main, I'm sorry, Main Street. Um, so that that's actually not an imposition that's made. That's yeah. actually, once again, market forces. But and there's no market forces may mean there's a lot more activity in East Hampton than there is here just because Indeed. it's Indeed. expensive to open a facility here. But the, so my question is we don't, we as a community don't regulate any other business in this way by limiting uh, drug stores, for instance, uh, drug stores which arguably could have the same impact. In fact, where oxycontin is available and other drugs like that, we don't put it. We don't have a an anticipatory cap. Now, obviously, pharmacies have been around a whole lot longer than medical marijuana or even legal marijuana, what's being called recreational marijuana, but legal marijuana is probably the preferred term. Um, but it, my concern is it's unprecedented. We don't limit frozen yogurt places. I mean, obviously, although there was a point in my life I wish we did, and we don't, or sushi, or whatever. Whatever happens, there's a particular trend. And obviously, the concerns aren't even comparable. But the fact is, we don't well, limit businesses. We regulate, um, that is, the Board of Health regulates where flavored tobacco products can be sold and they regulate 21 only places. But again, that's, by, that's by, by state law, there's only, you have to be licensed to sell those things. You have to, you right. have to go through the And you have to have a local permit. Yep. Like, same with alcohol, you have to have a local, local license And the well. Board of Health, and the Board of Health is the one that creates the age tobacco. criteria, right. the yeah. uh, sale criteria, and oversight over, over the licensure. Right. Which, so this is completely different. But it's it a it controlled is. substance. Uh, I'm sorry, yeah. hang on just a second. Okay. It's okay. We'll, we'll, and you'll get a chance to talk. Okay, sorry. So, yeah. so I think I think that it is unprecedented. It's unprecedented, uh, other than alcohol, for there to be this 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 kind of this kind of cap. Um, but I think it's appropriate that it, that this be looked at differently, just because it is new and it ha and we don't have a lot of data. And we could be surprised by uh, public health and, uh, and and public safety experience down the road, and I think that argues for doing something that is unprecedented because it's a brand new industry that we know so very little about, and I think that does argue for for caution uh, with an option of ramping it up more down the road. Actually, uh, Meredith O'Leary, to quote her correctly, she would prefer. Uh, an initial cap of should five in the first year, and then an additional five in the second year to ramp it up. We opted to just keep it keep it simple, call it a cap of ten, knowing that it could be adjusted down the road. And uh, I know Councilman Nash has something, so I don't want to uh, monopolize the opportunity to engage with uh, no, uh, the no, committee no, chair no, 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 here. Uh, sure, Councilman Nash. Thank you. Hello, colleagues. So I'm doing tick check before you speak. No, I'll I'll I'll, I'll keep it, I'll keep an eye on him. I, I, right. I've got his back. All right. So um, I'm going to spare you my whole opening s statement that I gave the other night, but there was an important two paragraphs in it. Um, we are embarking down a new path with an industry we know will present problems, as the many advocates from the prevention community 
have stated to us, marijuana use can impair one's ability to drive a mo motor vehicle, may impact brain de development in teens and young adults, can be addictive to those predisposed to dependency. Lastly, like it or not, the DEA still lists marijuana as a Schedule I substance with no currently, ex no currently accepted medical use and a high potential for abuse. We may disagree with that, but that's what's out there. Um, these views have come to us from our Board of Health, the Office of our District Attorney, our Police Department, and the network of people dedicated to preventing drug and alcohol abuse in our community. The cap that Councillor Bidwell and I are proposing is to give North, the Northampton community the space and time to acclimate, educate, and grow into this new industry. While I welcome retail marijuana, I am supporting this industry, I am not naive. We are not wel welcoming a typical new industry into our community, and the Commonwealth has allowed us a means to do so with a measure of caution. Our proposed cap is a surge protector that provides our new cannabis retail industry the room to grow, yet ensures we don't have a tidal wave of cannabis shops changing our city faster than we are ready to go. And that's, that really sums up my position on it. Why we came up with 10, as Councillor Bidwell has pointed out, is that um, through you know, talking with people in the business community uh, that, um, and, and talking with um, you know, the, the mayor, it, that we, we can see what's coming down the pike is probably like five or six shops. And, um, and that we didn't want to have something in place that was going to stop this new industry from coming along, which Northampton voters resoundingly supported the ideal of retail marijuana. But at the same time, there's been a lot of concern expressed. And so what is the number, you know, how do we, how do we address the concern? And there are going to be real impacts that for, for the police department, they are going to be dealing with, there's going to be more people driving around impaired buy marijuana just because it, it's being sold legally now. Um, and that we know that there's these things that are that are gonna be problems. And that we, we shouldn't just open up the doors and, um, and, and allow an unlimited amount to happen. Um, we can always lift this cap at some point. It's just, it's a way to create a, 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 a number that we're comfortable for allowing this new industry to get started at. Councilman. I have a kind of um, maybe naive question. Sure. To, that I want to pose. Well, we're naive too, so okay. um, So I've never smoked marijuana, and I don't intend to because it's becoming legalized, mm -hmm. because it's going to be available in shops. What, what, how do we have a sense? Do we have a sense? Is there any kind of data? Is there any kind of, um, I don't know, transferable knowledge from other drugs that when something becomes legalized, it necessarily increases the number of users? So Anyone? our proposal is, is, is based on the concerns of the prevention folks. So in terms of data, do we have data to back that up? We, when we look at like, well, we're, we're more familiar with the youth data. Sorry, I didn't mean to um, make you sit down, Jim. No, that's okay. I, I, I'll, here's an expert. Oh, so. no, I feel like, <laughs> you I don't even know, again, question. like the studies are pretty new. <laughs> um, I mean, I know what we see in Colorado, and there are like proponents of the um, marijuana industry that look at the whole state, and they say, oh, look, marijuana use by youth has gone down. But when you look at specific communities, because a lot of the communities banned it in Colorado. So there are communities that, and there's communities that don't survey youth in Colorado. And so for those communities like Denver, where they do survey youth and they do measure things, they're seeing that youth rates are really going up as, as a result of legalized marijuana. I mean, and we're seeing that in other states too. So it's, it's definitely, like in Massachusetts, we're seeing it go up after decriminalization and after, um, um, medical marijuana. So our youth rates are going up already. And it's just a normalization. I think it's mostly the association with the lack of sense that there's a risk of harm. If it's legal, what's the harm? 
you know, if, if it's being promoted as a healthy medicinal use, what's the harm? So as, as youth sense of harm, if they think it has no harm to use it, then they're much more likely to start using. Um, it's that correlation, I think. So in other words, the, the, um, the lack of legalness mm -hmm. of a particular substance mm -hmm. is associated with potential harm for most people. Yeah, there's that. I mean, like we did a lot of focus groups with youth um, many years ago, like in 2009, and we asked, you know, what's the main reason why you don't use marijuana? And honestly, over and over again, youth said because it's illegal. Like that, just simply because it was illegal. And then as we did focus groups later on, that wasn't, you know, as it was decriminalized, that, you know, obviously wasn't the, it's still illegal for you. Well, so for you, it's still illegal now. because yeah. they're under the right. age of. It's still illegal. They, they don't. Yeah, they, they don't. They don't I mean, see the it three, that way anymore. The, the top yeah. two drugs up until now that youth use all over the country has been tobacco and alcohol, the two legal drugs for adults. And now marijuana is in, like in communities like Northampton, it's actually higher than than others. And for youth, there's a perception that it's legal, but. You know, there really is a difference, I think, if you're talking, well, no, there really isn't a difference if you're talking about legal or not legal in terms of use. But that's also a perception of harm. It's not as the number one killer in the country, that it's, it's mm -hmm. as dangerous as anything out there, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but plenty of adults use it, so. Yeah. And I think the other thing that, just to consider, is the potency. So it's not like, I think that there's, because um, you asked about legal and I think the products that we're going to see on the market are a different product than when it was not legal. The access to high potency um, products and edibles and that kind of thing is a whole different, you know, oh, wax. Oh, oh, oh. Um, but yeah, so it's, I mean, it's really, it really is going to, I think the health and safety around that stuff is, is enormous. The, um, what I think I hear you saying or what I've heard you saying over the time. It's essentially, we want to send a message to the youth. We don't want them to get a sense that it's being normalized. And a cat would tell them that we're discouraging it at some level, and that therefore the corollary or the hope would be that youth consumption would be reduced in anticipation. I mean, I think a cat does send a message that, you know, that we care somehow, that there's a limit. But I, I think it's also that you just don't, that, that high density, that visibility of my 15 year old you know, kids coming downtown and just seeing store after store after store, we don't know if that's what it'll look like, but if we don't have a cap, we can, we, we don't know, <laughs> maybe that will be what it looks like. And for my kids to just see that, it, the prevalence of that. So it's not, it's also, it's the message you send, but it's also the actual prevalence of shops that are available to explore. And you know, even if they can't go into them, what they're, you know, what they're seeing, what they're hearing from older kids, you know, or I'll see one adults. or more stores would one, two, three, five, ten, twenty stores. I don't know, right? It's, I mean we don't know how many stores Well we do actually. Yeah. We do we do know how many stores and we also know that that built into the state structure there is so much there are so many uh, preventative systems. It's, it's a really high bar someone has to cross in order to open up a shop. And in order for it to blossom the way some of the predictions have come, mm -hmm. you know, suddenly we're overrun with over 10 shops, uh, requ requires actually a catchment area. First of all, a huge significant investment and vetting through the state and through the community and, and a public outreach right. conversation with every, every application. No other store in this, no other business in this in this city has to do that. Nobody opens up a pet grooming shop and has to go do a community outreach yeah. and then apply for application with a very likely chance that they're not going to pass muster, uh, investing hundreds of thousands of dollars that they don't expect to get back. Then there's the market forces mm -hmm. and how many people actually will be consuming marijuana. So if you take liquor licenses, for instance, as a parallel, mm -hmm. or how many people consume alcohol. And arguably, and I do believe, mm -hmm. at least legal alcohol trade is going to, for the time being, outstrip marijuana for the mm -hmm. time being. And that mm -hmm. there's not, and it's a much, it's a much lower bar to climb over mm -hmm. to sell booze, other than the fact is, yeah. right now, the biggest impediment 
is trying to find an available license to buy from somebody. Yeah. There's the, there's there is yeah. a license commission review. I mean, I think some of the differences between alcohol and marijuana, um, for example, like we do have caps for marijuana, and I know that there's ways to get around that, but it's not the yeah, alcohol. Sorry, yeah, we have caps with alcohol, but there and there's ways that people get the over quota and the you know BYOB and seasonal and all that. But um, at this, you know, but there are caps in place right now, and, and there are also minimum pricing for alcohol. You can't sell below cost kind of stuff. Um, we're seeing in some states that there's a race to the bottom with pricing on marijuana because there's no minimum pricing. And if there's this competing market force, you end up with these tanked out prices, cheap product, and then who does win in the end? You end up with the big, the big players that can come in and withstand that you know, the, those nice family marijuana retailers, maybe, who <laughs> can't withstand that kind of pressure of, of tanked prices. And then who do we end up with when we have that market force? So it isn't, there isn't that market force. Well, there's, there is a, there's actually reasons. a, a big structural difference in that for any retail store actually has to identify and provide a grower who's identified locally. Right. And I mean, that fact, actually is an erosion of a tier system which we have for alcohol, which again keeps prices higher. When you're the, the manufacturer has to sell to a, a wholesaler, has to sell to a retailer, the pricing that actually maintains pricing again for alcohol. It's one of the reasons for doing it. It's one of the reasons our state does it, is, is this three tier system, is pricing. Well, I mean, it, it's really true, right? I, I sat on the alcohol task force at the state level where they're looking to actually erode some of these laws. And even the Alcohol Beverage Control Commission is saying, you know, some of the rollbacks that they're looking at or the erosion of the three-tier system through the craft brewers is a problem because, again, there's big businesses buying up the craft brewers and then they are able to sell and buy and manufacture all in the same one tier. So the way we have it set up, we have a fast growth industry where they can go from, where they can own multiple tiers and not the tiers that are in the regulation, but it's like, it, it, it allows someone to own the, the growing, the selling, the delivery, the whatever, when that comes around. And again, it's just, a, a, and then grow from one tier inside the <laughs> marijuana regulation, you know, from a small business to larger, larger, larger. Um, it's a fast, fast growth industry here. And I think we don't know what that even is gonna look like. What does it mean for someone to come in here from Colorado or live here for a year, be a Massachusetts resident and then open and be a huge, really huge kind of industry. And the way that they have like lawyers that go <coughs> around the loopholes and sell, you know, it's just there's, I know that the regulations are good, they're tight, there's restrictions for youth, but we don't know. And if we don't think that we're ever gonna meet that cap of 10 in Northampton, then what's the danger in setting it, I guess, too? So, I mean, those are my thoughts. Councilor Nash, you better hand up. Yeah, I, I just wanted to say that um, I, and Councillor Bidwell and I pretty much agree with your assessment of how this industry is going to grow, that it's really difficult for this industry to start. There's there are a lot of obstacles, but at the same time, what you're hearing is that there's a lot of concern that it'll grow faster than we're ready for. And that's kind of where the 10 came from. It's like, where's the happy medium between the concern and and the realities of how difficult it's going to be. And um, so, and, and the, the, the last thing, it, to, to your point about we don't regulate any other industries, if you go through our zoning, if there, you, you can't open a retail establishment in, UR, in URC. You can't, uh, if, if you go through it, there's, there's all sorts of stuff you can't do all over the city. And it does detail specific businesses, you know, that they can go on in certain areas, but not in others. It, yeah, uh, and that's, I think that's being a little squishy with the interpretation because of, you're absolutely right. But it's not identifying one singular business with one for singular objective. For instance, uh, uh, porn, we have this discussion on our porn shops, if you recall that discussion about where we were going to limit to restrict porn stores because there was a resistance and a concern that the city would be overrun with porn shops. And so, but constitutionally we were precluded from singling out one particular legal industry for, from regulation. But in this case, we're allowed to by the state. No, and, and I, no argument there. Uh, the state does uh, provide that opportunity. And the thing, my concern, 
and I'll just say now as opposed to having asking questions, my concern is <laughs> creating laws out of concern is important. That makes sense. But we need something with a little more veracity and solidity to in order to create a law. Because unfortunately we historically make very bad law a lot of times. We make bad law predicated on concerns and worries about things that have not been realized yet. I'll give you an example, and this is, again, there's no corollary with marijuana. Segways were once um, popular throughout the rest of the country. The, there were people in town who were very concerned about the prospect of having the downtown choked and the sidewalks choked with segways and what harms and dangers would be looming. And in fact, actually, there was data brought forward about the Bay Area where, and, and, uh, where people were bumping into each other with segways. And they wanted us to create a law restricting and limiting segways, the amount of segways, oddly enough. And actually, I resisted that because it did, I understood the impulse, but at the same time, I did not quite understand the structural reason for it. Now, needless to say, I mean, I get to say, yeah, boo, yeah, what happened to the segway crisis never happened. I think what I'm hearing Heather say and I'm hearing you guys say is, what happens if suddenly, even though none of us anticipate the prospect of this happening, what happens if we don't have a barrier against this massive expansion? A potential for massive expansion or takeover of all of downtown for one particular business because of its popularity. I'm not sure I feel comfortable saying that if the public and the community chooses to uh, patronize these businesses, that we we don't want them downtown. We don't get to, that's the part that concerns me. We don't get to pick, I don't want cell phone stores and sunglass shops. But I can't, I certainly can't make an argument that it has potential harm. But I understand when we come out of a, a prohibition, the reluctance and resistance and concerns about what's possible and what could happen. But we have to compare it with, comparing it with alcohol is not proportionally fair. Alcohol is a much more dilatory consumed drug. Schedule one doesn't mean bupkis because schedule one was designed politically, not medically. Um, cocaine consumption, Oxycontin exposure, uh, methamphetamines, those are complete, all, all structured in the same, but on medically dilatorious impacts are vastly different. And so my concern is our impulse now is predicated on possibly, in my interpretation, excess of caution. Um, that, and I understand the sponsors offering this. It makes perfect sense. I understand the concerns expressed. But at the same time, it hasn't reached for me a threshold where I think it's appropriate for us to make unprecedented law regulating one business that currently uh, is heavily regulated by the state with lots of catch points. And if it's, if it's to send a message, a, you know, kind of an amorphous message to the youth, that's a terrible reason to do it, unfortunately. Because so I don't think it's message sent to receive. It's not about sending a message. It's about that there's real impacts of people using marijuana. No, it, no argument. It, that's, 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 no, that's why real, we're on Real it. impacts, absolutely true. Absolutely true. There's and, the, and of course, we know people use marijuana now. And I'm not going to take a vote and see how many people consume marijuana in this room. But the fact remains that we know one hasn't. We'll leave it at that. But what I'm saying is that the um, yes, there will be effects. There will be impacts, and there will be changes, and there will be a cultural shift. There is a cultural shift already. What we do? Are we going to create a law to somehow? moderate or ameliorate that cultural shift, I don't think that's the best way to make law a person. I'm only speaking for myself. Mm -hmm. I, I, I clearly am not speaking for the rest of the committee, but that's my, that's my assertion. Um, Dennis, if you will hang on a second, I want to see if other counselors yeah. uh, or the members of the committee want to speak at this point. Um, no? Council Murphy, no? Dennis. I, I, I have no problem um, creating a law that in three or four or five years would, re would be regarded as bad law. Because we just get rid of it. I would, I, would, I, would, I would rather make that mistake 
than to make the other mistake, which was to have an opportunity to impose some reasonable regulation, but have missed the opportunity to do so. So that, that's that's my own view of that. And let me and let me just what I was going to say before uh, uh, about this being unknown, and we, we do know there's going to be public safety effects. We just don't know how many and what their impact would be. We do know there's going to be public health effects. It's hard to measure, but something that I didn't know anything about before was just how much edibles is a part of, of, of this market, and, and that will change. The edibles will become dramatically more available. And the, the public safety, the law enforcement issue there, and the health issue is, and, and, I've, and I, I have some, some people, friends of mine, have, have told me these stories, and in this case it really is true, that that the difference between smoking or vaping and an edible is that uh, an edible takes a considerable long time to, to work its way into your system and have its effect. And so you can, and, and the, the, the labeling, on, and I know this from my own touring of Meta, is incredibly sophisticated. There is so much data, laboratory analysis of the contents and the project, projected impact. The problem is that the projected impact of one uh, portion of edible, you may, after an hour, say, this isn't doing anything. And so you take another one, and there's still no effect. And it may be three or four hours till, till you feel the effect. And by then, and this is this is a, a law enforcement concern, and there's anecdotal evidence of this, hard to measure both in California and Colorado, but by the, by the time it's taken effect, you're driving or you're, you're, you're doing something else. And so I think, I think, it is appropriate to be cautious in general. I think it's particularly appropriate to be cautious and as, we, as we learn about um, uh, the impact of edibles from a health point of view and from a, and from a public safety and law enforcement point of view. And I don't, I don't, think, it, uh, I don't think that represents an excess of caution. I think what does a cap do relative to edibles and your concern about edibles? I think that if there, if there are impacts from from uh, a store doing business in edibles, it, there, there's going to be a certain level of impacts at 10. There's going to be a certain level of impacts in that community at 15. It's just a quantifiable thing. I I tend to believe that there's going to be more impact with 15 stores than than 10 stores. Can you explain why? Because I think to a certain extent it's 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 a market. I I, I don't happen to believe that. Whether you have three stores or 15 stores, you're still going to serve the same number of clients. They're just going to be divided up differently. I think there's a uh, there, there, there's a certain uh, point in the marketplace where you become known as a, a major uh, distribution or availability point, and you just have a lot more customers and a lot more traffic. And and we are certainly going to. And, and I think a, a, another point where it doesn't come where the alcohol comparison isn't totally up is there are there are a few dry communities where there are not liquor stores. There are not very many of them. There's a lot more so-called dry, free of marijuana communities in, in the in Western Mass. And so I think that is going to make Northampton more of a more of a hub. And uh, certainly uh, cannabis tourism is going to be a big deal. And certainly Northampton's tourism industry uh, and hospitality industry is going to be all over that. And I just think there's more of it with 15 stores than 10. That's all. And what, whatever health and, and law enforcement effects there are, there's going to be more of them with 15 than with 10. Subscribing to supply and demand basic form economic structure. Uh, demand, you think, will be that high to the point where it's possible that we see 15, 20 stores here. And mind you, we're not the It's only possible. I don't think so. Like I said, I think we're going to be in the five, six, seven range. But I do think there's some merit in, but what if we're wrong? Okay. That, that, that's what it comes down to. That's right. why I call it the what if we're wrong ordinance. And I'd, ra I'd, I'd, rather, uh, I'd, I'd rather put it in place and have you tell me in four years that, see, I told you, it was bad law. I'd rather make that mistake than the other mistake. So. Any other questions or discussion on it? I have a question, but it looks like um, Heather wants to respond directly to what no, we're talking about. No, it's okay. About. Go ahead. Well, I mean, I, I, I uh, okay. Um, 
I mean, I guess I, I'm just recalling when there was the hookah incident in Northampton, the hookah bar. I, and I have to say that the description I heard at the council meeting, which I wasn't allowed to comment, what actually happened with the hookah bar, mm -hmm. of course, as you recall, what Board of Health actually approved it yeah. uh, when Dr. Flighton was on the board, as you recall. Mm -hmm. yeah. And um, inappropriately, it was not, it was not, he, he, he had no business approving it because it was consumption of tobacco that was limited mm -hmm. by the Board of Health and not allowed. Yeah. Um, that was the city. The city actually, we ended up paying for it mm -hmm. uh, because of some misunderstanding of the Board of Health, but there was not the city, there was not the city. But it was, it's at a time when that whole <coughs> ventilation issue was, you know, sort of misunderstood and all, all kinds of stuff. And it was, that was a new, new in the, in the world of, of tobacco and tobacco freeness, you know, and how do we regulate no tobacco, you know, kind of things like that. But I will say like in the world of prevention, all the time are we setting regulations that are um, pre, would, preemptive or something like where um, right now we just heard that Cambridge has a champagne vending machine where that eliminates that face-to-face -face contact to you know if somebody's intoxicated right uh, we haven't seen vending machines here they're in Japan we local regulations don't really rule them out right now um, the ABCC. The ABCC Certainly. has ruled them out yet. There's also like a yeah. mobile beer truck that's been roaming around, you know, Chicopee, and which was licensed by the ABCC. But it's not, you know, it's not clear like who, who licenses them locally. But so there's towns can actually say no beer trucks in our town. We're, we're not really sure on the state licenses, but just to be sure, let's not have mobile beer trucks. So let's not have vending machines here. In case they come, we better just sort of say right away. Let's not wait till someone spends their fortune on trying to invest in the community to do this thing that we don't really think is a safe option here. So it's like, I think it's it's sort of just like also respectful to businesses to not have an endless amount where at some point we're like, well, this is way too many. When do we put the, the limit on it? When someone's in the middle of their investment? I mean, it doesn't make sense to me. And why would Northampton be like one of the very few, few towns to have no cap? Like every other town is doing it. It's it seems like it's there's people that have put a lot of thought into this for good reason. I don't disagree. I think. Yeah. Anymore. But if you know, if Johnny jumped off a bridge, would I jump off a bridge? I think it. I don't I'm know. More concerned. I, I think a lot of people have put a lot of thought into this. Oh, no, a lot no of towns doubt. that have that, had committees working on this for years. But I have, I have not heard a persuasive case personally about the efficacy that would address the concerns that you've expressed the efficacy yeah. of this device that would actually, with the tipping point of 10 versus 12 yeah. or 15, I, I haven't what we it's, it's hard to measure, but we do know that the World Health Organization lists density, outlet density, advertising, and pricing as some of the three top reasons why it, there's an increase or decrease in alcohol consumption, both adult and youth. And it, and the, the density has to do with the exposure, and the um, and it's also oftentimes in you know communities of color and, and disproportionately affected communities. I mean, there's that issue too. Right. Um, and not just uh, exposure, but access. Things. Yeah, and, and access. Sorry, thank you. Um, and and pricing, we know that you you can say like 21 year olds can't get in in to buy the product. That really doesn't mean that the product isn't going to get into the hands of under 21 year olds and a low price is going to increase that access to them too. It does transfer over. And I mean, in fact, you know, right now we see it with the vaping industry where, you know, 24% of Massachusetts youth are vaping compared to 2.9% of adults. And it's still being, and, and I mean, you should see the candy flavored products that are being sold. Well, I, have, just, I have, I have, I, um, and, I'm, and I'm concerned. But the supply, we're, we're, I mean, the supply and demand is that you have to start with young users that are going to be lifetime users. There's a bell, know, business bell curve around supply and demand, The too. state currently has a structure, for instance, for casinos, mm -hmm. which I, I'm completely opposed to, which is basically they allow casinos to be built and established, mm -hmm. but the state picked and choose, could pick and choose which community they went into, mm -hmm. and then preclude licensure for any other comp competing interests, thereby creating a regulated state maintained localized monopoly. I have a problem when we start to tinker with markets and 
to tinker with businesses in that respect. We're told all the time that we're not particularly business friendly in this and this mm -hmm. instance. And, and I keep arguing that I disagree. But at the same time, I don't want, I mean, one of your arguments was it's not fair to businesses that uh, it, we're not. To, to we stop, can't, to stop, to set a cap once they've, you well, know, that's, once that's what concerns you know, me is right. because if we, we do would, it now. We would actually, we would, we, 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 we would actually create um, or potentially create a competitive manipulation. And again, a race to the bottom on pricing. Right, but that's not our job, and that's not what we should do. It's I mean, my honestly, job. Honestly, I think when we make law, that's your job. That's and, a different job. And that's with all due respect, there's a there's more people here tonight, which isn't very many. Who um, like so you can have your opinion on it, but uh, I think there's also you know. I Fair don't enough, know. Heather, and that's and I may lose this vote. And the yeah. fact is, is that that um, you know the board of health. A non elected body is yeah. capable of making rules and regulations. Yeah. There are some limitations on this, yeah. uh, different than some of the other uh, ones that have been approved by the state. Yeah. But um, insofar as we're the legislative body, my, I'm particularly reluctant to make laws that actually manipulate markets. That's but it's, I, it's, I think it's prudent, and it's a public health issue. It's, it's, maybe it's not a market issue, and maybe we do need to sometimes interrupt the market to look at public health. Maybe there's times where, in the past, Advertising for alcohol and 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 commercial industries used to be a separate freedom of speech than it was for people. And over since the 70s, that's eroded, and it's one and the same now. We have so many protections for industry. We have so little money going towards public health. Policy is one of the most effective things that we can do for public health. And you know, it's 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 cheap and it's effective, and you know, it's really necessary. I mean. And you, I think you just put your finger on it. Yeah. The Board of Health makes policy. The, the council makes law. Well, I mean, the Amherst... The Amherst no, and Amherst did. And, look, and, look, and I, I don't want to... Yeah. Personally, I, I understand what Amherst has done in East Hampton and other surrounding yeah. communities. I have no, I understand. I, and they've done what they think is the best thing, most efficacious way to, to uh, protect their community. I mm -hmm. have a different perspective. And so far as I can tell right now, it's new. Mm -hmm. So I'm worried too much. Yeah. Don't sweat that. Let's move on. So you got you got two oh. members here who are sponsoring this. Mm -hmm. uh, I haven't heard from the other members, and we'll, we'll get to a vote once yeah. once everyone feels like. And thanks, vote. and I'm sorry if I didn't. No, that's okay. It. I, I hear you. No, I understand. <laughs> uh, anyone else? I have something else. For you. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, you from other. <laughs> um, I really appreciate all the work. Um, you folks are doing around prevention, and I completely understand the reasoning for coming forward with this, uh, with the cap, because you know the state allows it and other things. But I'm also, I share the same reticence, and, and it does come from, you know, uh, one of my experiences, which was the adult use zoning that we had to pass, uh, you know, at the at city council level. Um, it, I mean, it did pass. I was opposed to it. I think it passed at a six to three or something. But that was a similar attempt to regulate a particular industry and say that it would not, it could not be located um, in certain areas, in certain areas of the city. And it was singling out that type of retail from other types of re retail. So um, for some of the the same reasons of. Um, I mean, that was certainly free speech and my, my discomfort with singling out that industry. I have some, I have a little bit of discomfort too, but I'm reserving judgments. I mean, I don't know what will come forward in terms of a recommendation from here, whether it will be a neutral. I know that we have the opportunity to still hear more and many people probably couldn't even get into the building tonight, so. So to hear more and then hear from colleagues when this comes up again on Thursday? Yeah. Yeah. Right. right. So those were um, kind of my thoughts. But I do appreciate the, you know, the public health concerns that people have. I'm just not sure, as Councilor Dwight said, you know, um, whether um, enacting, enacting a law based on that concern is appropriate. So we'll see, we'll see where that goes, I guess. Council Murphy, you haven't had a chance to talk yet, no? Council Klein, did you have something to say? Yeah. Um, 
I'm going to pull it, Councillor Nash here. Mm -hmm. uh, Councillor Nash in our um, city council meetings um, often states his his confusion about um, which way to vote. And, you know, weighing both sides, and I'm really in that place. I oh good. <laughs> yeah, just you're not alone. Um, <laughs> You know, I, I'm sympathetic to this kind of policy argument that we, you know, I work in public health too, and I really get that we, as a society, can make policy, and you and I, uh, Councillor Dwight, differ on what is policy versus legislation. I think legislation creates policy too, and it's not a different beast. Uh, I, I do think that with legislation, we can create policy that helps to, um, affect things that can be detrimental or uh, deleterious to the public health. And, you know, I, I think about myself growing up as the, the kid of two parents who smoked really heavily and really suffered from it. And over the years, you know, they're, they're, we, we started to have recognition as a society how incredibly unhealthy smoking was. And, laws started to change and you know, warnings came out and billboards weren't allowed and so we have done things as a society and in fact I think um, smoking rates have gone down over the last many decades and it probably has a lot to do with the kinds of um, policy approaches, legislative approaches that were taken over the last many decades. So I get that and I think that there are some very important pieces to what I'm hearing from my fellow counselors who have spoken around regulating the market. Um, so I'm really holding both of those things and um, feel a lot of internal conflict around them. One other thing that I just wanted to mention, and this isn't necessarily a question, it is more um, kind of playing the devil's advocate, I guess, to what we're hearing from the advocates in uh, the audience today is that I've had a bunch of conversations with um, our director of, um, to get this right, uh, Brian Foote, the, the Arts. Arts Council Director for the city. And he's a huge proponent for arts purposes and for tourism purposes of, um, the way that he explains it to me is that 20-somethings and 30-somethings really need um, outlets for gathering, for um, for use of something that isn't as dangerous as alcohol. And um, he feels like it can be a huge boon to the arts community and to the city in terms of um, just giving 20-somethings and 30-somethings a way to gather around arts events and around um, the, the shared use of a substance that is now legal, that is, again, less dangerous than, marijuana, than uh, alcohol. And so he feels like a cap would be, I think, really um, misguided. And I took that to heart when I had a conversation with him. He made a really cogent argument for why um, kind of allowing marijuana to flourish in whatever way it develops could be a real boon to the, to the city. Um, so that's just another <coughs> little piece that I want to put out there that we haven't really talked about, you know, how it can affect the city positively to have kind of an unfettered level of access to, um, to marijuana use now that it's legalized. And then I guess the last piece that I keep struggling with around this is that in Massachusetts, but especially in Northampton, an overwhelming majority of people wanted to legalize marijuana. And I did hear your point, Heather, I think it's an interesting point about how people didn't envision necessarily, you know, a plethora of shops on Main Street or something, but um, for social justice reasons, they, they wanted to legalize marijuana. But I, I, don't, I don't know that I, I don't know that I can assume that that's necessarily true that people don't envision pot shops on Main Street. Um, and I, I do think that the, the voters in Northampton made a statement. That said, I know that when um, cultivators want to um, open up a cultivation facility, 
people are all of a sudden like, oh no, not in my neighborhood. So there is that tension and that kind of, I guess, affirms in a certain way what you're saying. So, I mean, I, I just think that this is a very murky, um, not that it's murky, but that there are real arguments, strong arguments on both sides here around um, a cap and other kinds of regulation and and letting kind of free market design really manage this. So I'm I'm really in a quandary and uh, trying to trying to understand more and figure out kind of what what I think needs to be done. Um. Well, we should probably vote on this. I, I, well, may I suggest um, yeah. um, we would have the opportunity to hear from our other colleagues uh, on the council. Uh, I mean, we will one way or the other, but if we sent it with a neutral recommendation. Um, As opposed to a negative or a positive. Vote. Right. Um, okay. Well, that, well that I'll would, offer that then. Uh, Okay. With the so currently, what we're discussing is an affirmative. Uh, that I'm happy to withdraw that option. Okay. Option. Right. Okay. With the second. Okay. So there's a motion for a neutral recommendation. Is there a second? Okay. Discussion on that recommendation. I mean, I've, I have lots of other debate points and stuff like that too. <laughs> that I will save for the the council meeting. <laughs> so it'll be worth showing up on Thursday. You betcha. Okay. okay. Well, I'd like to encourage you to share at least the, um, the highlights of them because I think it would be useful be for our, <laughs> our, <laughs> our moving first. forward if you're looking the for council meeting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I will I, share with you this. I, the one thing is that actually saturated fats are far more pernicious. Consumption of saturated fats kill more people and contribute to more health problems which is at an epidemic scale, and that's you, everyone affecting the you smoke a French fry? It does. <laughs> but the fact is, we don't regulate donut shops. We don't. And this is the argument, actually, that I carried when we were talking about the adult uh, video store that was coming to town. I said, you're on the corner, one corner you have that you have a store selling cigarettes, and in another corner you have a store selling liquor, and in another corner you have uh, you have Dunkin' Donuts selling saturated fat. The fact is we focused on, because of, a, a, of an emotional cultural issue, the fact that this was the first time this business was coming to North Hampton. Well, point of fact, what happened was we created a law that allowed that place to be there, but actually made Pleasant Street video illegal. We were in violation of the law, but we were comforted by the people who were proposing the legislation saying, no one would ever file a complaint against you. Unfortunately, no one did. But that's not good law, and we don't create law um, trying to govern the market of donut shops because of their stock, yet they sell stuff that arguably is much worse than marijuana and the consumption of it. And whatever message that sends, whatever it does, whatever fat, whatever mechanisms that it triggers within the culture and how we behave and react to those things, that's out of our ken, that's out of our jurisdiction. So we do allow those. Donut shops can open up any legal pla any place zoned for uh, restaurant sales, and any restaurant can sell saturated fats. They can send you your to-go stuff out in a polystyrene uh, container. Arguably, also very pernicious. This one enjoins a lot of emotion, and it prompts a lot of emotion. Um, when you come out of a very long-standing prohibition, and there's all sorts of, lots of, I mean, a, a prohibition that was actually predicated on racism, had very little to do with dilatorious impacts. They didn't have the studies that Heather has available to her about the developing teenage brain. That wasn't an issue. It's about uh, uh, African Americans going mad and raping white women. That was literally the debate on the Senate floor when this law came. We've moved into this emotional stage. We've moved into this emotional transition that's significant and huge. As, as the sponsors have said, as, uh, as all the people who spoke have said, that we want to proceed with caution. And I would argue the state actually has been proceeding with caution. This, is, this has been legal. The vote occurred over two years ago. And 
the state has spent a very, very long time hearing from all constituencies, all with the same concerns addressed about issues of potency, proximity, uh, uh, availability, appeal to children, and so on and so forth. And I understand the desire to put our mark on it, but I haven't heard a reason why this particular law, a cap of 10, admittedly arbitrarily <laughs> decided on it, would have a, a significant difference one way or another. That's not the way I prefer to make law. So that's, and that would be arguably the same case I'll make on the council floor. And so everyone can be ready for that argument when it comes up, if you're ever here it. So, um, ready for a vote on this? This is on a neutral recommendation. All those in favor of forwarding this to the council with a neutral recommendation, please say aye. 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 Okay. All right. Back to the rest of the agenda, which is significant. We have um, item 18.072, this is an ordinance relative to parking on Hooker Avenue. Uh, this is referred to the Transportation Parking Commission and then legislative matters and uh, uh, first of all, accept a motion, put it on the floor. Move to approve. Okay. Uh, Councilor Carney, you want to speak to this? Well, I, um, I, there is a map there and the ordinance, I, I think, it's the actually, ordinance the itself. The map is up there now. Oh, okay, yes, 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 okay. So, um, I, I think where it, where it shows on the left, the blue lines show um, no parking at certain times, meaning there are signs on Hooker Ave that say no parking overnight. And what's proposed on the right are elimination of that, and that's why I'm checking with the, with the ordinance that was submitted. Yeah, it would be basically getting rid of this ordinance and there was some investigation into the history, um, actually since Councilor Nash is still here. This came before transportation and parking. That's why I'm still here, yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, so I was going to ask, did, Thank they, you, Evan. Thanks. did they confirm that this was something that happened? Did they know what the history of why the no we, parking? We could not figure out what the history of this was. Other, The only thing we knew is that it went on the books in 1987, oh. and the assumption is it had to do with some business that was taking advantage of overnight parking. Right. And then it wasn't enforced for ages. And right. and then apparently what happened was people, residents, were parked in front of their homes, and I don't think it was a complaint generated. No, the signs were put in, unfortunately. The signs got put up. So well, it, well, the, well, the reason the signs got put up not just coincidentally, they, they got put out because the police, even without the sign, I think people were ticketed. Right. People were oh, ticketed. People there was there was some sort of emergency services event that either the police or an ambulance had to get down that street, and that there was cars parked on in this manner on either side of the street, and they couldn't get through. And then they realized that oh, this is a no parking zone oh, they're parking here because they can't read the signs. That's why they assumed. And the next day, all new, within a short time, all new signs went in, and then ticketing started, and the people on Hooker are like, what's going on? So, um, and then, uh, and what triggered it is that, that, uh, that uh, DPW looked at it and figured that um, actually that, you know, parking should be allowed on both, both sides of the street, and that, um, and so that's the recommendation before you tonight. Yeah, it's wide enough. I don't think that there's a question that even though there may have been something. Yeah, there was. It was due to snow. Okay, that's, the that's snow okay. had encroached, and it triggered everything. Okay. Well, the concern, of course, is uh, the ability of an emergency vehicle to navigate the street even in the snow. So I don't. Know. I haven't heard anything about the emergency vehicle piece. That's what I heard. That. What triggered things. So. Okay. so we haven't heard anything from fire rescue or anybody else. No, so this is approved by uh, Maggie looked into this and that this this plan is sound and that um, and it got a positive recommendation from TPC. Questions, discussion? Okay. All those in favor of moving this forward with a positive recommendation, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Uh, next item is uh, 18.073. This is an ordinance relevant to parking on Vernon Street, also referred to TPC and legislative matters. 
Uh, well, Council Nash, since you're here, you want to share with us your sure. thoughts on this issue? And so actually, this, can you do with the podium? Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. Sure. sure. And this is another one that got triggered by uh, snow as well. So oh, hold it. This is a different map. That's you don't have, oh, you don't have the other map. Oh, well, okay. Yeah, let me yeah, so Thurman is. Street. We need longer arms. Hey, oh, almost. Is this it? Um, yeah, just That's you have scroll yeah, down. You have to scroll down to get the yeah. whole map. Do, 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 do. That's scrolling up. Yep, no, I know. I'm used it's to it. Damn, there's Vernon Street. There you go. All right. Is enough of this? Yeah, I'm still learning. Okay, that's before. That's it. Yeah, okay. We got different colors this time. Yeah, different. So, uh, um, that this was also triggered by uh, snow and in cars and parked cars encroaching into uh, the right of way. And that, um, so the request was that no parking, uh, the parking be allowed on one side of the street, but not on the other here. And um, this came before the TPC uh, and um, it was uh, recommended that we uh, have no parking on one side and just allow parking on the what is it the northern I, it's upside down isn't it yeah so I don't know which direction is which here it's on the so on the upside here <laughs> well you can see on the street the high the school top. is to the left it yeah. says which direction it says on the southeast side oh I've got it back to, I got it backwards in my head so it is oriented correctly so the red is prohibited on the southeast side prohibited on the Southeast side, which is correct. the red, right? Uh, the red, yes. The red is prohibited. Red is bad. So I have a question about this one. May I sure. Address? Uh, I'll Council? see if I can answer it. Um, so there's a portion here that it's going to be prohibited completely in front of about two houses. Um, have residents been coming to the TPC meetings and expressed what they want in terms of parking in front of their houses? What happens if you ban this much parking on? I Wednesday? believe this was generate. This started with somebody coming to to the TPC and lodging the the concern, and uh, I forget the woman's name, but she actually went through our new online system to lodge the complaint. It came before the TPC, and this was the the solution that. You're saying uh, she was one of the residents. Yes. Oh. This started with the re resident. Well, one of complaint. these that's, that's going to lose parking in front of their home? Well, one of these is a medical building, isn't it? No. Is it the no, isn't that an apartment building? 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 That's residential there? With yeah, a parking lot? it's a block or so. Oh, there's so multiple units on that? Yeah, yeah, those are multi-units. Yeah, there's no businesses. Then that drive, that big driveway where there's no parking is what wraps around behind the church and goes over towards the house. Oh, house. okay. Yeah, I see. It's okay. Yeah. And where and when it does get filled up with parking is during uh, when the high school is in in session, people will park there. Yeah, yeah I guess I would just be concerned about people coming to us later saying, "What? Where are people supposed to park when they come and visit us?" I wish Councilor Bidwell had stayed because this is. You have a sense how many spaces you're eliminating? Um, I have. Uh, no idea I could guess. It looks like a lot. It's it looks like a lot. It's almost the whole street. We could ask for clarification with a sending a neutral recommendation. Yeah, let's send something off to DPW. I, I could ask that question for the clarification. And we'll have Councilor Matt on Thursday. On Thursday yeah. yeah, and we'll have Councilor Bidwell on Thursday. It's his word. You can explain TPC, you can explain. Right. Neighbors. Yeah, so if you can get for the council meeting inventory. Neighbors, a set of neighbors agreement. I mean, how, which, how much inventory are we eliminating here? Because uh, clearly, if we're talking about 20 cars. We're moving them somewhere else <coughs> in someone else's neighborhood. So I don't know. We just want to be careful there. Yes. Yeah. So, so um, I know where they're going. To. <laughs> yes, I do too. Murphy's house. Yeah, they're they're going to Murphy's house. <coughs> so. So I'll move that. With a neutral recommendation. Okay, and I'll provide yeah. more information on Thursday. Okay. All right. There is a, there is an affirmative. So, uh, uh, so the 
moved it to approve. You moved to approve. So, so yeah, we're changing, changing that to move for recommendation. Okay. All those in favor of sending this with a neutral recommendation in, in the hopes that we have more information, uh, please say aye. Aye. And opposed. Okay. Well, we've done the next item. So last item on here is 18.098. This is an ordinance to delete sewer use. Chapter 260 of the North Hampton Code. This is referred to us uh, at our last one. I'll make a positive recommendation of it. Since it's somewhere else. Since it's somewhere else. It, went, it just went somewhere else. It did go somewhere else. It went. Uh, actually, it doesn't say where this went. Where Good night. Went. Good night, Jim. Thank you. See you soon. Yeah, you on your way out. I know where I'm going to see you. The donut shop? Yeah, donut shop. Donut shop. After that, we'll go to the form store. Oh, it's a gym now. Okay. Um, that donut. Good luck getting out. So, just was only referred here, it looks like, on May 3rd. I think it's just a housekeeping thing. Yeah, this is the. Um, I'll read it quickly. It's a short one on ordinance in the city of Northampton, providing that the code of ordinances uh, be revised by. Um, by revising chapter 260 of said code providing that sewer use and be ordained by the city and council blah 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 section one that chapter 260 of the court of Ord ordinances of the city of northampton massachusetts be amended is the, so that such section shall read as follows uh, chapter 260 delete the last item that says chapter 260 and added place thereof reserved See sewer use regulations listed on Northampton Um uh, This I spoke with Council uh, City Solicitor Seawald. He drafted this, so he approved it. <laughs> and it is a house cleaning thing that I don't know much more about, other than that it was just a simple house cleaning. I just went somewhere else. It sounds like yeah, it's, you know, you get it on the website. It's it's just moved somewhere, somewhere else right. for location. So. And so where it was has to be right. a reference Erased. to the location. So. Uh, so, a motion to approve. Positive resolution. Right second. Oh, second. Any discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Move to adjourn. Motion second. to adjourn is seconded. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. aye.